Brothers and sisters, welcome. We're going back to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the church of Pergamos, verses 12 through 17. And I can just say I am totally encouraged to do this teaching today. I've been working on it for quite some time. A couple of times I messed up. I finally got it down perfect. It was 43 minutes. I'm going to get and I look at it and I have no volume. So I'm like, okay, Satan doesn't want to get this out. So I'm doing it again. I'm partway through and I'm like, it's going great. All of a sudden I get a message I've never seen before. It says, Dave called me, can't hear you. I'm like, what is going on? Well, for our weekly Bible study that's tonight, one of the other members of our Bible study is going to be the teaching. So he went on to make sure that everything was good and that he could get in. So that like he sort of jumped in on mine and it was just interesting. So I really think that Satan doesn't want this to happen, but I'm going to continue until it does happen. I think some people can get some really good information, really good understanding of the Bible from this. So the, what I would encourage you if, you, if you hear this and you don't like what you're hearing at part, um, and we're going to talk about, um, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute what exactly is going to be the part that's kind of long and involved that people may not like, and then I'm going to do it. If it bothers you, it might be a reason for you to listen. All right. So before we get started, let's talk about the book of Revelation real quick. Um, when I first started studying prophecy, I dug into the book of Revelation. Yeah, chapter 4, 1 to the end. And I was writing down everything because I had it. I figured it out. So then when I do, I started a Facebook group, Revelations Discussion Group, wanting to find out that it's Revelation, not Revelations. I thought I knew it all. I didn't know anything. That was 17 years ago. I mean, I knew a little. I knew a little more than I did before I started. But see, the book of Revelation is what's called apocalyptic literature. It's written by symbolism. And there's about 500 symbols here that all go back in the Old Testament. And that it's sort of like the Old Testament is the key and, and Revelation is the map to end times. And you got to put the two of them together to get the correct understanding. If you don't have the key and you're just looking at the map, then our imaginations start filling in what those symbols are. And that's what I did. That's what I see people doing all the time. Um, now, these and I mentioned that I dug in. Chapter 4 on. Chapter 4 1 is where we see the rapture. Skipping over these, the letters are just as important as everybody else, as everything else in this book, because the letters are for churches and it transcends times. It's for the church it was sent to, it's from churches throughout the generations, it's for churches today. Each of these apply. Each of these seven apply to churches today. I know people say, no, just the Church of Philadelphia. That's wishful thinking. They all apply because there's elements of everything from these seven churches in the world today. And each of these letters say, he who has an ear, let them hear. Okay, that's everybody. We all have ears. Now, if that phrase, as it's written elsewhere in the Bible, that says, he who has an ear to hear, let them hear. Those are people that want to hear, that are digging into the Bible, that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that are trying to discern, that want to hear. It's not that it's hitting the eardrum and bouncing right off, you know, if you follow what I'm saying. Okay. Now, each of these letters, we've talked about this before, each of these letters has a greeting. The greetings are the way that Yeshua introduces himself. Hi, I'm Dave, but he does it with symbology, and it refers to things throughout the Bible, and it gives you a big picture of who he really is. The next thing it has is commendations, good things, condemnations, bad things for the churches. Some have both. Okay, it's what's going on in their church. That's what we need to look at because those are the things that are happening in our church. And then the exhortations. What does he strongly encourage us to do? That we need to look at too because it's for us just as well as it was for the people in Pergamos for the letter that we're going to dive into. And then lastly, it gives promises. We also know that these seven churches apply, these promises apply to us because they're all eternal. And the seven promises together paint a picture of, of the promises that God has for us in the kingdom of heaven. All right. So these letters are very important. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read through it first, then I'm going to, then I'm going to tell you the part that you might have a little trouble with, and then I'm going to start teaching. All right. Um, and to the angel at the church of Pergamos, right? These things says he who has the two-edged sword. I know your works. 
I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name um, and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual adultery. Thus, you have also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Repent, or I will come to you quickly, and I will fight against you, fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the church is, plural. To him whoever comes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. All right, the part you're not going to like is when we get into the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Um, to eat things that are sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual adultery. This is huge. This is huge. I, I, I encourage you guys to listen through this. See, the thing is, how did he introduce himself here? That's one with a two-edged sword. To the people doing this, it says, repent, or I will come, a, come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. We do not want Yeshua coming to fight against us with the sword of his mouth. This is important, folks. Okay, I'm going to start breaking it down. All right, let's go to um, verse 12. And the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these are the things, says he, who has the sharp two-edged sword. Well, we know from our other Bible studies that angel means messenger. It can be a cherubim. It can be a seraphim. It can be Michael. It could be... Gabriel, um, Michael is usually the warrior. Gabriel is usually the messenger. Um, how many named angels are there? Three or four or two? How many? Well, there is Yeshua. Well, he's not an angel. You have Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Three. All right. Anyhow, yeah, people forget Lucifer was one of those three named angels. Um, these things, says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. So let's look at that two-edged sword. Uh, Hebrews 4, verse 12. That's where we're going to go first. Hope you got your Bibles open. Oh, wrong way. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <coughs> so the sword <coughs> represents the word of God. It discerns. It the hearts of us. So it's by the word that we're judged because it discerns our hearts. Make sense? Divides everything. Left, right, who do you belong to? It's by the word. All right. Um, let's get, now the word of God, does it change? Does the word of God change? Let's go to Matthew 4.4. 4. This is important to understand that the word of God does not change. We're going to talk about when Yeshua is in the desert being tempted. This happened um, during Teshuva, a 40-day period of prayer and repentance that culminates with Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, the high holy days, the days of awe, um, Rosh Hashanah being rapture, Yom Kippur, the judgment day at the end of the seven years of tribulation. Thus, in between, that 10 days really represents tribulation, the seven-year period. Um, so that gives you a time frame from where this is going, happening uh, on the calendar. Um, Revelation, uh, Matthew 4, 4. 
So this is um, Satan is tempting him, and here's how Jesus answered. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. He doesn't say, well, just the one, these words, but not these after I'm crucified. He's saying every word. At this point in time, what words are there? There's the Tanakh, the Old Testament. That's all there is. Now, granted, you can say, well, God knew the other parts were coming. Yeah, he wrote it. But he also wrote the stuff in the beginning. And he's not giving any limitations. He's just saying by every word from the mouth of God. All right. So let's go to, from here, Hmm. Wait, here I am getting lost here. Let's go back to Revelation. Again, put a pen, put something in it. You'll come back to it. Let's go to Revelation 116. He who had his right hand, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun and the shining of it. Okay, so is, is a literal sword coming out of his mouth? No, it is the word of God that's coming out of his mouth. That sword is the word of God. Let's go to Revelation 19.15. 19.15. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. And he, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads himself, he, tread, um, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. That winepress, when you trace that out, this is a judgment day, it's Armageddon, and blood is going to run a bridle up to the bridle of a horse for so many furlongs. It's basically the, the length of Israel today. It's a lot of blood. How can so much destruction, how can so much stuff come from the word of God? Well, again, it's how we are judged. And it's in Armageddon, it's how people are going to be judged. It's at the rapture, how people are going to be judged. It's when they're throwing people into the lake of fire. It's how people are going to be judged. It's important. That's why Yeshua is, is um, Introducing him this way, but it's also the people who aren't getting the message to this church. They're going to, they're, he's going to come after them with the word of God, with the sword coming out of his mouth. So this teaching, I think, is is is, is going to be really powerful to somebody. Because um, if you're not doing what he's saying to do, judgment will follow. All right, back to Revelation two. I know the works. I know your works and where you dwell. I know your works is found in all of them. Okay? He knows what you're doing. There is nothing you hide from God. If you ever have a thought, oh, oh I can do this. Nobody will know. You're calling you nobody and you're calling God nobody. Think about it. We've all had those times. Where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was the, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you that where Satan dwells. Where Satan dwells. It's funny when you look at this, because I've read this scripture, the synagogue of Satan. Um, actually, it wouldn't have been this one, but you'll find that elsewhere. This is where Satan dwells in Pergamos. There was actually a platform, a place where it was known to be where Satan dwells, and people worshipped him there in Pergamos. Um, it must have had some power, or somebody thought it did, because Hitler took that apart brick by brick and moved it to Germany and made some of his most impassioned and fiery speeches to rally everybody together for the, the war effort. What else were they trying to do? Exterminate all the Jews. Why would he want to exterminate the Jews? Because if there are no Jews, then Jesus can't come back. Of course he can come back. He can do what he wants. He is God. No. He can't do everything he wants or anything. He cannot lie. He cannot be a false prophet. He said in the tail end of Matthew 23, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Actually, he said, you won't see me again until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was to the Jews. And if there are no Jews to say that, he can't come back. But you know what? He knows the end of the story. How does he know? He wrote it. He knows he's going to come back. All right. Anyhow, um, 
Yes, it, that's that turn is actually an interesting story, and there's a lot of stuff that I've seen about it, and you could talk about it. I'm not going to get into all of that. I will mention this: that other people believe that 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 um, seat of Satan has some power because uh, President Obama went to Germany and made some of his speeches at that very same spot. You can take that for what it's worth. All right, I'm just telling you facts. Um, so he's saying that I know your works. And that you have, let me, yeah, sorry about that. Give me a second. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even when, you know, Antipas, my faithful martyr, was killed among you. In other words, they're sharing Yeshua. They're doing what he's told, even though they live in an area where people are worshiping Satan. That's the commendation, that they're doing the right things. Um, notice he says they held fast to the faith. Um, they held fast to my name, to their belief in Yeshua. They held on to that. Is it possible you can let go of it? According to this, there is. See, I don't believe once saved, always saved. I think you can walk away from your faith. Um, yeah, because otherwise he wouldn't have commended them for holding fast to the name of Yeshua. You don't want to deny that. I'm not saying it's like you did something wrong or whatever and you're no longer saved. No, we're all going to do things. It's when you start denying that faith. All right. Um, just don't want to get anybody into thinking the wrong thing there. Um, and we'll see that a little later. We look at an overcomer. You'll see what that means. All right. Let's um, keep going on. All right. So that... That word they held on to. Let's. I want to go back to Matthew four real quick. You know, we we just read this verse about every word, and it is. One second, that throne of David. Give me a sec. Okay, can Satan have a throne on earth? Does he live here today? Is he here today? Can he be here today? Is this God's world? Is it Satan's world? Whose is it? Because if it's God's world, how does Satan have a throne? That's what I want to look at. Let's go to Matthew 4 again. And again, it is written, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Skip down to verse, um, I guess I want to do 8 through 10. And the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Notice Jesus didn't say, hey, bud, sorry, you know, you can't give me what already belongs to me. This is my world. How are you going to give it to me? Huh? It's not what Jesus said. He just said, away with you. So I guess we can, in Jesus' name, Say away with you. Okay, let's. Um, so if this is Satan's world, then people will be worshiping Satan. And they are. Oh, my goodness. Ways that they don't even know. And we're going to touch on some of those. But the simple things are, in the beginning, God created. Then the Big Bang Theory. That the earth just sort of somehow came together and became what it is. I'll tell you what, if, if God, my word, spoke and the world happened, that's going to make a pretty big bang. Um, in the beginning, God created a male and female. That's an issue now. That's weird, but it's now an issue. The whole thing with marriage, sexual morality, homosexuality, being forced down everybody's throat. You know, we, we love the sinners. We hate the sin. We want to bring everybody out of sinning. We want to bring everybody to God. But you can see they're attacking everything in the book of, of Genesis. Why? If you don't believe Genesis, you won't believe this word we're studying here in Revelation. Okay? And Satan wins. This is his world. Why would you say that? Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians to, um, 4. Second Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, you can't see it, 
It is veiled to those who are perishing, those that do not have Yeshua, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. So there is a God of this age, and it's not Jesus. Who do not, do not believe, least the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, excuse me, who do not believe, least the light of the glory of, of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So it is his world, the glory of God, the light of it can shine on them through the veil, but they got to believe. If you don't believe, this book here is nonsense. It's foolishness to those that don't believe. But he is the God of this world. And believe me, people are worshiping him. Um, you see it. You know, people look at this world like it's really evil. You know, in the last days, they will call what is evil good and what is good evil. We're seeing that. There'll be a day that, you know, being a Christian is going to be outlawed because it's hate speech. And they're already knocking people off platforms that teach the Bible. Um, anyhow, let me keep moving on. Um, yeah, Satan blinds people. So many ways, he's very deceptive. He blinds people to the, the gospel of the glory of God. But the, the commendation he's saying to these people is that they're holding fast. They're still doing God's work. They're sharing Yeshua despite being martyred in a, in a hostile environment. I don't know how much more hostile it gets than being at the, the, the Satan's throne. That's the commendation. Let's go to 14. But I have... Before I say it, remember he introduced him as a sword and then he's going to repent or I'll come at you with my sword and I'll attack you. I will um, fight against you. This is the common, the condemnation. This is what we're going to dig into. This is what's really important. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things, sacrifice to idols, remember these things, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. All right, let's go back and learn a little bit more about Balaam. We know he's the guy with the talking, talking donkey, right? We're going to go to Numbers 22. Eh, why am I like all over the place? Just in my head about things. Uh, numbers 22. Here we go. Just thinking about what I'm going to say and how to present it and how to do this. Um, verses 1 through 6. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the sides of the Jordan across from Jericho. Okay, this is modern day Jordan, right across the Jordan River. They're looking into the promised land. They're that close. They're on the verge of entering the promised land, which is a picture of the millennial kingdom, which has, we'll be going into Israel in the millennial kingdom. So it's a picture of that. They're that close. Now, Balak, the son of Zippor, Balak is a king. We'll see that. Zippor saw all of Israel, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. They wiped them out. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because there were so many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. The children of Israel is a mixed multitude, Jews and Gentiles who attach themselves to Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, that's a city in that in Moab, um, um, in, in that area, let me just leave it at that. Now this company will lick everything around us as an ox licks up the grass in the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Baor at Pethor. Pethor, which is near the river, in the land of the sons of the people, to call him, saying, look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth, and they are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me. 
for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he who you curse, you curse. This king missed one thing. It's not the prophets that bless and curse something. It's God. And you cannot curse something God has blessed. Ain't going to happen. Um, if you read through the story, and please do, you'll see God has some interactions with Balaam about what to do, tells him not to go. He comes back, asks again, says, okay, go. But he's like mad when he does go. Um, and he's on his way the second time. That's when his donkey turns and speaks to him and says, hey, don't you see that? The son of man, the angel of the Lord up there with the sword in front of us. Um, I can imagine my chickens, if they started speaking to me and giving me warnings like that, I'd freak out. All right, so now we want to go to verse 35 in Numbers 22. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go to the men, but only the word I speak to you that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So when we speak, we should be speaking the word of God, not saying that God said this or God told me. He said, no, we speak the word of God. Um, let's go to Numbers 25. Um, one through nine. Now Israel remained in Acadia Grove, this is in Jordan, that we spoke about, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. So when you see har harlotry, sexual immorality, and worshiping pagan things. Uh, and I'll tell you why we know that it's that. But this, they invited the people to sacrifice their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So they're eating things sacrifice to pagan gods, what we just read in Revelation 2. So Israel joined to Baal. Okay, that's the one. Baal. <clears throat> You'll see this in many forms. You'll see a lot of people's names attached to Baal. 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 I think it's Baal. Um, that word means husband. We know that the church is the bride of Christ and Christ is the groom. What a lot of people don't understand is that in Exodus 19, um, Israel was betrothed to God. So God was the husband, Israel was the bride. We actually see this explained when you look at the new covenant um, in Jeremiah 31. It mentions that. So, um, so in other words, we're talking about a, so whenever you are worshiping other gods, you are breaking that covenant that relationship you're in sexual idolatry you are um adulterous this is the harlot on the beast that we see from revelation 17 a false religion riding on a government um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later um so, so Israel joined Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against them. Then the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord, out in the sun, that, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, every one of you kill his men who are joined to, the, to Baal of Peor. For indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren, a Midianite woman, in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. All right, think about this. They're weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. This is where they met with God. They're weeping. They're rep repenting, confessing. They're, you know, okay, we have sinned. And they're like, you know, pouring it all out to God. And here comes this guy. Hey, take a look at this girl here, this Midianite. Isn't she pretty? We could have her. Wouldn't she be better than having this God we don't that we don't see? Okay, scripture doesn't say that. I'm just throwing out what it could be like. So what's the response of him presenting this Midianite woman? Now when Phineas, the son of 
Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, so this is the priestly line, saw it. He rose among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, and the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Wow, that's a lot of people. But it was only a small part, just a little bit. See, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, there were 600,000 men, plus women and children. That's pretty miraculous for 430 years and 12 brothers becoming 600,000 people, plus women and children. In other words, millions and millions of people. That's pretty miraculous. No, no, it's, it is, but it's because they saw the plagues. They saw what God did and say, oh, I'm going to go with them. I like their God when he got out of Egypt. That's what the that's why children of Israel mixed multitude. You got to remember that. Um, let's go on to Numbers 31, 1 and 8. And let's see the end for Baal. Excuse me, the end for Balaam. Numbers 31, 1, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of, uh, for the children of Israel. Afterward, you shall be gathered to your people. Verse 8, and they killed the kings. Of, they, so they, they went after them. They wiped them out. Um, and they killed the kings of Midian and the rest of those who were killed. Eva, Rechum, Her, Zer, Her, and Reba, the five kings of Midian, and Balaam, the son of Baor they also killed with the sword. So it didn't turn out so well for him. Remember, the, how did they get killed? The sword? The people that are following this way, the sword that comes out of his mouth, he's going to fight against them. All right, let's keep moving along. Go to Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 4. So we're going to start getting a closer look at what this really is. This pagan idolatry, worship, eating things worshipped to idols, sexual immorality. Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 4. I know you heard me. I'm telling myself. All right. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord your God and fathers has given you to possess all of the days you live on the earth until the Messiah comes back and is crucified. Oh, it doesn't say that last part, does it? Remember, this is not just to Israel. This is to a mixed multitude, to, you, to Christians. You can use the term if you wanted, but to Gentiles that have tied themselves to the Lord. You shall utterly destroy all the places, the nations. You shall dispose and dispossess, serve their gods. And on high mountains and on hills and under every green tree. These are places where they worship them. And that should actually say evergreen tree, not every green tree. We're talking about evergreen trees because they were special in the worship of these idols. And you shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from your place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. Is that clear? Is that is God leaving anything out? Is this something you can discuss? Well, maybe we can do this, but not do that. No, he's making it clear you don't do that. Well, see, unfortunately, that's what Constantine did in the fourth century. Um, he brought in pagan stuff, Easter, pagan, look it up, Easter eggs. Oh, my goodness. Duh. When you find out where they came from, basically said, you know, I'll kill you if you don't do it. We're, no, we're, we're not going to do anything the filthy swines the Jews do. You will not worship Passover. You'll worship Easter instead. Easter, Ishtar, not good. Um, same thing with Christmas. Christmas goes back to um, King Nimrod, his son, Tammuz. Not good. Um, the 40 days of Lent is the 40 days of, of uh, mourning for Tammuz. 
there's a lot of stuff in there that is straight out of what they used to do in the pagan religions. It's not good. Worshiping on Sunday, not Saturday. You know, it's okay to worship on Sunday. We should be worshiping every day. But God tells us to keep the Sabbath holy. These are the things that he's talking about, about, the, about Balaam. It's important. Um, let's keep going on. Let's go to Jeremiah 25. Verse 6. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of my hand, and I will not harm you. Wait a minute. Is that a warning? I think it is. Do not go after other gods and serve them and worship them. And do not provoke me to anger. So if you do those things, it's going to provoke me to anger with the works of my hands. And I will not harm you. So if you do those things, he will harm you. We just read that in Revelation. Coming after me with the sword. Okay. Um, Jeremiah 10, 1 through 6. Do not learn to wear the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven. The signs of heaven, again, it all goes back to Babylon with King Nimrod. Signs of heaven is the queen of heaven, which is Queen Samarius. No, you're not going to find Queen Samarius in the Bible. You're not. It's queen of heaven. Um, <clears throat> had a son, Tammuz. Then they die, come back to life. It's King Nimrod reincarnated. And this is like their Jesus Long story. That's why you have the mother-child religion, all the other false religions, mother-child. This is why Mary is a god in Catholicism. Um, let me just keep reading. For the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are futile, worthless, come to no avail. For one cuts down a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold silver and gold if you don't know the song it's a christmas song um they fasten it with nails and hammer that it will not topple they are upright like a palm tree they cannot speak they must be carried it's pretty bad when your gods have to be carried can't get from here to there oh that's what it says because they cannot go by themselves do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil nor th nor they can they do good don't be afraid of them, but don't participate in it. That's what he's been telling us. Oh, my goodness. Um, go to Job 14.4. Job? Yeah, Job. I know. Where do you find it? It's actually right before Psalms. So I think it's, it's the oldest book. You'd think it'd be further back. Job 14.4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Oh, wait a minute. See, clean and unclean talks about the food. That's going back to Leviticus 23, about what's clean that you can eat and what's unclean that you don't eat. Interesting that the things you're not supposed to eat are all scavengers. They're all things that sort of eat the stuff nobody else eats, and they sort of keep things clean. Yeah. Um, so it's saying, who can take something God has said was unclean and make it clean? No one. That includes Paul. Paul can't do it. That's not what he was doing. He was talking about people. He's talking about the Holy Spirit can enter into Gentiles. People get that one confused. Um, think about pigs. Who can make them clean so you can eat them? Nobody. We're going to see more about pigs. Um, before we do that, let's talk about that for a second. What is it that was sacrificed to gods? Children and pigs. Remember the uh, pigs that, you know, Jesus went across to the cutter in the graveyard and healed them and the, cast out the legion of demons and they went into the pigs and the pigs ran into the sea. And everybody got so upset. Why do they get so upset? Because of the pigs. This was not a Jewish place. This is where they raised these black pigs of Gedalia. And you know that from the cities and the places that are talked about. And that's what they did there. And these were the very expensive pigs because these were the pigs used in those sacrifices. All right, let's keep moving on. Let's go to Acts 15. And we're taking a little rabbit trails here in a little bit, but it, it's worth it. Oh, 
Thomas, there. John, Roman, is that too far? Acts 15. Start with verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. We're in Galatia. This is where this is occurring. Um, you know, the Galatians. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Is this the law? Is this Torah? No, it's the custom. Custom, not law. See, there were Jewish customs and there was biblical law. Now you'll read biblical law in like Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And the thing is, we can't read it in English. Well, you can read it, but you can't really understand it because there are verb tenses in there. They can tell you that something's negative, something's positive, something's temporary, something's permanent. It can only be read in the Hebrew when you really understand Hebrew. We can't read it. Luckily, I've got a guy that I learned from who does and can. So these were people coming down to Jerusalem saying, no, 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 you got to follow everything, even all the Jewish customs. That was the topic here. The customs, not the law. This is where the book of Galatians comes from, too. It's, it's Paul's response to all of this. And he wrote a letter to them. Um, so if we go down to the end of this, basically he gave them a number of things to do in order to get into the temples. And th there they can learn everything else. But here's what here was the bare minimum that they had to do just to get into the temples. And it's in verses 28 and 29. For it seemed good to have the Holy Spirit and to, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, to abstain from eating things offered to idols. That's pigs. <sighs> Anyhow, um, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. That's all the pagan worship. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Granted, this is what? After Christ has been crucified, after he's been buried, after he's been resurrected. It's not saying, oh, you don't have to worry about all those things now. The law is over. It's done. You can eat anything you want. God doesn't care. No, this is afterwards. Let's keep going. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 2021. 20, 1 Corinthians 10, keep in mind the people who were doing these things, that's who Jesus says that he could come back and fight with the sword that comes out of his mouth. We don't want that. I would not, if when the rapture happens, I would definitely not for any way want to have somebody want to be eating a ham and cheese sandwich. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 20 through 22. Let me go ahead and find it. And here we go. Rather, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons, not to God. Okay, this is talking about the sacrifices, the pa pagan sacrifices and all that. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake in the Lord's table or, and of the table of demons. Or do, we pro, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? That ain't good. Are we stronger than he? Nope. Hmm. You can't mix. There is no mixing. It's God's way or Satan's way, pagan way. Um. If we walk in pagan idolatry, are we still in good standing with God? No, you can't be. Let's go to Jeremiah, and we're just about done with this part, and we'll get back to the Revelation. Jeremiah 66, 13 through 18. I'm sorry, I have Jeremiah written here. It's Isaiah. Again, Satan didn't want me to make it. 
it's funny, a neighbor just knocked on the door, I paused, I, I'm like, nobody comes where I live. I'm like kind of out there, so I'm surprised seeing somebody come up to the door. And um, so he had mail delivered to his to my his mailbox. And I look at it, I'm self-employed, and he handed me a ton of checks. I'm like, oh, let me get out and post these. I got these in the bank. So I'm like, no, no, I need to finish my Bible study. He really is trying to distract me. Now I can't even turn to Isaiah. Here we go, Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 is end times. Isaiah 66 is talking about the talent of tribulation, Armageddon, the millennial kingdom, all of that stuff. He just talked about, um, we're going to start in verse 14, I believe. 13, 14. And he's talking about like how Israel will come back and they see God fight for them. And then he says, when you see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. Okay. Division, two things. It's not Jew and Gentile. It's who do you follow? Okay. A lot of people say, well, that's Jewish. You don't have to do that. That's not, there is no division like that in Scripture. It's who do you follow? Do you belong to Satan? Do you belong to Yeshua? That's the only division there is. And see, those that are his servants shall know the hand of the Lord shall be known to them. The hand is power. It's protection. They're going to be protected. And to the enemy shall come indignation. Whoa. Read Isaiah uh, 26, 19 through 21. Indignation is tribulation. We're not here. That's good news. Okay, let me keep going. I'm going to read there's a lot of verses about fire coming up. Fire always means judgment and prophecy. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind. That means it's going to be quick. When he, when he attacks, it's quick. To retend, re, re, render anger to his, with fury, tribulation, Armageddon, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the fire, for by fire and by sword, we know about the sword, We've been talking about that. The Lord will judge all flesh. Who gets judged? All flesh. Everybody. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. Now it talks about who those slain are. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves. People who are doing it by themselves. People worshiping pagan idols. Why do we, how do we know pagan idols? To go to the garden after an idol in the midst eating swine's flesh. This is the way of getting judged at that time. I would not want to be eating a ham and cheese sandwich at that time. Eating swine's flesh, piggies, and the abomination. Leviticus 11 talks about clean and unclean food. The word abomination shows up there 11 times about what food is an abomination. Abomination's not good. All right. There's one time it's not abomination, it's abominable, and that's what you are if you're eating it. Leviticus 11. And the mouse. Yes, you're not allowed to have a mouse sandwich. Luckily, I've never been tempted to have a mouse sandwich. But when it says the abomination, that's all of those things in Leviticus 11. And they, people doing it shall be consumed together, says the Lord. All right, let's go back to Revelation 2. I'm just going to read that little part one more time, why we spent all of that time talking about it. Keep in mind, he's introducing himself to the guy that has a two-edged sword. And at the end, we're going to see he's going to, that people who are not doing this are going to be fought against him with a two-edged sword. Because I have a few things against you. It's never good when God has something against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine. You have there those who, not everybody, a small, probably a small percentage, just like there was only 24,000 out of the millions that got killed with Balaam, that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, which thing I hate. I'm not going to go into detail here. This one's long enough. Um, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was actually worse 
they basically believe that God came and people are this way today. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Once saved, always saved. You, you've accepted Yeshua. You can do whatever you want. And you're good. Not true. That's what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was. No law. But see, the law is the Ten Commandments. It's loving each other. It's all of that. Okay. This was the condemnation. Now we get the exhortation. What is it he's telling us, strongly encouraging us to do? Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Repent. Not to say, I'm sorry, I won't do it again until I do it again, and then I'll say I'm sorry again. It's stop doing it and do the things that you're supposed to do. If you don't, I will come to you quickly and fight with them against the sword of my mouth. And that's what we see in Armageddon. It means you might be here. I don't know. I don't know where that line is. I'm not the one that judges. I just read scripture. And it's enough to make me know I don't want to take a chance. All right. And then, and then he says, he who has an ear, this is to everybody, let them hear what the Spirit says of the churches. He who overcomes... I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Let's look at an overcomer. We've done this in other teachings, but we're going to do it again. So the overcomer is in 1 John 5. I'm not even looking at my notes for a lot of this because, again, Satan didn't want me doing this video. I know it. <coughs> lots of distractions, lots of things. It wasn't recorded. I'm like looking now. Am I playing? Yes, it's recording. I got voice. Okay, I'm good. Uh, as long as Troy doesn't try to get back online. Yeah, we, sh we share the same account because he's using it now because he's going to start the video study. The, he's going to do the buddy Bible study for tonight for us. Um, here we go. First John 5, verse 4 and 5. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And I have no problem with that. We are saved by grace through faith. That is how we are saved, period, by our faith. But you walk with faith. Anyhow, he, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Four and five. Let's read one through three. Give context. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. In other words, just read a couple verses and you don't look at what's around it. You can make a mistake. Let's read the beginning of this one through three. Whoever believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God. And anyone who loves him, who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Yeah, so if you love Jesus, you're going to love everybody else, right? Yeah, makes sense. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and, and his commandments are not burdensome. Remember, John's one of the last, is the last biblical writer, um, and he is writing because he's seeing these things creeping into the church. So you get the hidden manna. Okay, that's Hebrews 9, 1 through 5. And we'll come back to that a little bit. Let's read through. We're going to read through the rest of this, and we're going to look at two verses, and we're done, I promise. Revelation 2. I know this is long, but I thought this was important. He who has an ear, let him hear to what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who ever comes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone. I got white stones all over the place outside. Why do I need his? All right, we'll see. I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. All right. Um, go to Hebrews 9. 1 through 5. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. 
for a tabernacle was prepared. And the first part in which was a lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. This is the, not the, you have the courtyard, the outer courtyard. You have the sanctuary, which is like a holy place, but it's not the holy of holies, which is further in. Um, and these were the implements, the articles, the furnishings, the things that are in there. Um, behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacles, which is called the holiest of all, that should be holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold in which were the pot and had the pot that had the manna Aaron's rod that budded in the tablets of the covenant and above it were cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail so the manna was in the ark of the covenant Okay, that's all we really know about what that part of this means. That's all I know. Um, what does it mean they can't speak of these things in detail? They're like strict, God told them not to? No, they haven't had the Ark of the Covenant since before the first temple fell. They, they don't know what it looks like, really. They didn't have like Polaroids back then taking pictures and videos on it of it. All right, let's go to Isaiah 62, and we'll, two, and we'll look at that new name that's on a stone. And I'll tell you this, the white stone is back in that day in court. They used stones in courts. Yeah, they stoned people, but that's not what I mean. Um, a white stone represented innocent. A black stone represented guilty. So your name being a name being written on a white stone that's given to you is talking about innocence. We're going to Isaiah 62. I'm like sitting here talking and flipping aimlessly. I do that. Isaiah 62. Almost there. 1, 4. We go 1 to 4. Yeah, 1 to 4. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her unrighteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation. What's the, what's the word for salvation in Hebrew? Yeshua. <sighs> until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her Yeshua as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall, shall see your righteousness and all the kings of your glory and shall be called by a new name, which will be, which the mouth of the Lord will name. There's our new name right there. You shall be called, you, you shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem. In the hand of your God, you shall no longer be termed forsaken nor your land anymore be termed desolate. Isn't this more to the Jews? Again, the Jew, Gentile, that's not the divide. Who do you belong to? I appreciate you watching. Um, I really do believe this is one video Satan doesn't want to get out there. So share if you think it's worthy and you think somebody would be benefit from this, share it with them. God bless you guys. Take care.